That's better. Thank you all for coming today. Really appreciate you joining us here today. Uh, thanks for coming out this morning. Um, I think we've got a really exciting morning uh, of discussion. Um, so first of all, brief introductions for myself. I am Witt Salmaber. I'm the director of the Stevenson Ocean Security Project here at CSIS. Now, the Stevenson Ocean Security Project is a relatively new program we launched earlier this year. And we are a program that is explicitly focused on the intersection of marine sustainability challenges and national security issues. And from my point of view, there is no better representation of that nexus than the issue of climate change and how it's impacting our oceans and what that means for our broader world. Now, a few weeks ago, the IPCC released a third in a series of reports uh, about <clears throat> looking, taking a deeper dive in some of the impacts uh, that climate change is having on the world. First, as you may recall, earlier this year was focusing on what a 1.5 degree world looks like and what it would take to get there. The second focused in August, <clears throat> released in August, focused on the impact on lands. And then the one released uh, during Climate Week at the UN focused on the ocean and the cryosphere. Now, that report is fascinating. It is uh, the current state of the science about what we know, what we understand, um, the impacts of climate change are going to be on the ocean. And it posted a really, really stark view of the differences between taking strong, aggressive action and taking no action at all, continuing along the course that we are on. It talked about uh, a real divergence in paths with respect to um, change and needed adaptation based on what kinds of actions we take from a policy perspective. Now, there's been quite a bit of discussion, I think, over the past couple weeks about that report. We're going to talk a little bit about that report today and what's in it, but I want to take a special focus today on how the challenges and impacts that the report uh, describes translates into policy issues, and in particular, how those policy issues are reflected in the security space. Now, over the years, climate's been called a readiness challenge, a threat multiplier, a source of instability. Uh, it poses acute threats for today and strategic threats for tomorrow. But the ways in which the physical and ecological impacts translate to specific security issues can sometimes be a little vague. And unfortunately, as we know, bureaucracies don't do well with vague. So what I hope uh, today's conversation can do is move that dialogue forward and that we can think a little more deeply about the ways our natural, social, and security spheres are intertwined. As we do so, maybe we can move towards a more forthright and direct approach to coming up with solutions. As I've said before in this space, we need to manage the changing world of today for the changed world of tomorrow. So we're in luck. We have two excellent panels. Uh, the first, which I'm going to just hear uh, momentarily, uh, is going to talk about the science of the report and some of the findings and how those findings might affect specific policy issues. The second panel is going to talk about how those policy issues translate into security challenges. And then we're going to close up with a keynote uh, where I'll be joined by uh, the recently retired Admiral John Richardson, the 31st Chief of Naval Operations. So uh, I'd like to thank you again for coming today and introduce our first panel. Uh, I'll just briefly run through everybody here, and then I'll ask Co, our first uh, speaker, to, to come up and say a few words. So uh, we've got Co Barrett, who is the Deputy Assistant Administrator for Science at NOAA. She's also the Vice Chair of the IPCC. We've got Bob Watson, who is the Chair of IPBES, the Intergovernmental Panel on Biodiversity. Uh, we have Paula Bontempi, the Deputy Director of NASA's, NASA's Earth Science Division. And we've got Kathy Mills, who is a research scientist at the Gulf of Maine Research Institute and Pew Fellow. So thank you again for joining us. And Co, I'd like to welcome you on stage. Let's see if I can find you. OK. Thanks, Whit. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, it's my job this morning to just kind of kick off the conversation by providing uh, some of the most relevant findings from the report that we uh, put out just two weeks ago. And as a, as a kind of introduction to the report, uh, we're looking at the ocean and cryosphere, the frozen parts of the world, and their relationship to climate. And it's really the first time the IPCC has looked at the furthest reaches of the planet uh, to see what's happening uh, with regard to climate. So from the very tops of the highest mountains, the polar regions, to the deepest parts of the ocean. And what we find is that already there, and especially there, we're seeing um, evidence of human-caused climate change. Is someone going to advance these slides for me, or shall I magically do something? OK, great. Let's go to the next one, too. Uh, I'm not going to be able to talk about the high mountains and some of the, um, thanks, the um, coastal, yep. Um, 
you know, some of the coastal impacts uh, in my initial presentation, although happy to kind of dive into those with questions. Uh, but I kind of view the report Where do I point? <laughs> so I, I'll actually just kind of um, continue a little bit. We'll let the slides catch up to us. Um, so uh, kind of one of the main messages uh, emerging just from a macro level from the report is that for decades, the ocean and cryosphere have been taking the heat for climate change. Um, and we are seeing the manifestations of that across permafrost, glaciers, um, ice sheet melting, uh, changes in uh, ocean chemistry, and resulting changes in kind of biodiversity, um, the movement of fish, Etc. <laughs> okay, great. So, um, so the way I've structured this report is to just focus in on a couple of the changes that the report finds have already been observed, to briefly touch on what possible futures could look like, and then to talk about um, some of the implications for the uh, for marine um, policy. And, and for species migration, et cetera. So um, one of the main report findings uh, is not a new one in terms of Greenland and Antarctic ice sheets melting. However, the new finding here is that these are now the major drivers of accelerated sea level rise. And these areas are melting from below, which is uh, um, causing it's now kind of surpassed ocean thermal expansion as a major driver for sea level rise. During the last century, we find that um, global mean sea level rise rose by about 15 centimeters. Right now, um, sea level is currently rising at more than twice that rate um, and continuing to accelerate. With uh, the highest uh, emissions pro uh, scenario projections, we could be over one meter of sea level rise by 2100. Also, over the uh, last 40 years, Arctic sea ice extent and thickness has very likely decreased for all months of the year. Uh, but sea ice changes in September, which is when we usually see the lowest sea ice extent, is likely unprecedented for the last 1,000 years. Next slide, please. Uh, the loss of summer sea ice and spring snow cover on land have contributed to amplified warming in the Arctic, where surface air temperature likely has increased by more than double the global average. Uh, the ocean has taken up more than 90 percent of the excess heat in the climate system and about a quarter of uh, human-caused CO2 emissions, making the ocean warmer, uh, more acidic, and uh, losing oxygen. Marine heat waves, which is a new topic, and Kathy may actually expand on this in her, her presentation, have doubled in frequency since the 1980s and have become longer lasting, more intense, and more extensive, especially um, harming warm water corals, kelp forests, uh, and the distribution of marine life. Next slide, please. I know you can't actually see the details on this slide, but I include it because this is this is kind of a graphic representation of what our choices on emissions reductions look like for some key areas. So on the top left is uh, the projections for marine heat waves moving into the future. The blue is, is kind of a projection for the lowest emission scenarios that we studied in our report. The red is a projection for the highest emission scenarios. And you can see quite clearly the difference if we choose a more intensive emissions reductions pathway. Um, below that frame is a graphic on Arctic sea ice extent, which isn't a good news story no matter what scenario you pick, quite frankly, uh, because even with a high emissions reduction scenario, we are still looking at something near 50 percent reduction. But with the with higher emissions, 
scenario, you see near 100% um, near um, reduction of sea ice extent in the Arctic in September. And the large graphic just shows the difference that would happen with uh, these two emission scenarios with regard to global mean sea level rise going out to 2300. So a uh, stark, stark difference depending on what um, action pathway we take. Next slide, please. So clearly there are implications for marine sustainability and security. Since about 1950, many marine species have undergone shifts in their geographic range and seasonal activity due to warming, sea ice change, biogeochemical changes um, to their habitats. In general, ecosystems are moving poleward. Uh, our recent ocean warming has contributed to an overall decrease in maximum cash poten potential, compounding impacts from overfishing for some fish stocks. In some areas, changing conditions have contributed to the expansion of suitable habitat, but it's not so easy. Uh, sometimes the governance uh, structures uh, regulating fishery don't make it possible to take advantage of the benefits that could be seen. Shifts in species distribution and abundance has challenged international and national ocean and fisheries governance, including in the Arctic. Um, and in terms of regulating fishing to secure ecosystem integrity. Next slide, please. Food and water security have been negatively impacted by changes in snow cover, lake and river ice, and permafrost in the Arctic. These changes have already disrupted access to and food availability within um, herding, hunting, subsistence um, uh, living areas, harming the livelihoods and cultural identity of the Arctic. I had the chance to uh, visit um, Alaska last month and saw firsthand how indigenous peoples are already having to change the way that they hunt, where they go to hunt, um, and it's, it's quite um, extreme. Um, so they have adjusted the timing of activities to respond to changes in the seasonality and safety of land, ice, and snow travel conditions. Summertime Arctic ship-based transportation has increased over the past two decades with sea ice reductions. This has implications for global trade, yes, but it also poses new risks to the Arctic marine ecosystems and coastal communities. When I was in Nome, just within a 24-hour period, two tourist uh, cruise ships came into port, having traversed from Greenland across the North Sea. Next slide. So. Um, just final slide for me, I, the you know, main takeaway from these messages, I think, is the more decisively and earlier we act, the more able we will be to ad address avoidable changes and manage the risks from climate change. Look forward to the conversation. Thanks, Whit. Thanks, Co. Uh, Bob? Well, it's a pleasure to be here this morning. I was the former chair of the Intergovernmental Platform for Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services, but what I'm going to talk about here is what came out of this rule. Co has actually covered it already in many respects. You've heard how we're changing the Earth's climate. It's becoming warmer, oceans are rising, sea ice is melting, the glaciers are melting, the oceans are becoming more acidic, we've got more persistent organic pollutants in the oceans, more heavy metals in the oceans, it's overfished most of the oceans, so we've got a problem. In fact, I just came back from an Arctic Forum meeting, a ministerial meeting, and the question they were posing is, is the melting of sea ice an opportunity or a threat to national security. And that is indeed the uh, dilemma of these ministers. And they were foreign ministers that were there, uh, not environment ministers. But it's quite clear that since the 1950s, many marine species have undergone a shift in their geographic range and seasonal activities. Therefore, there's been a shift in both species composition in all parts of the world's oceans and the biomass productivity in each of these ecosystems. Also, we're getting different interactions now between species, and these are having cascading effects on both the structure and the functioning of these ecosystems. And just to put it in perspective, these ecosystem services are absolutely central to human well-being. 
There's been, a, as Co said, there's been a poleward shift in different marine species, both towards the north in the northern hemisphere, the south in the sun here. And since the 1950s, there's been shifts of up to about 50 kilometers per decade in organisms in the upper couple of hundred meters of the world's ocean, and about 30 kilometers uh, per decade for species on the sea floor. These are significant changes. Arctic primary production has clearly increased in the ice-free waters, and springtime phytoplankton blooms are occurring earlier in the year. Unfortunately, many associated marine mammals um, and seabirds are be, have it been very negatively affected uh, by effectively habitat contra contraction. Nearly 50% of coastal wetlands have been lost in the last 100 years, 50%. Changes in seagrass meadows and kelp. They're both expanding at high latitude, but they're contracting at low latitudes, basically. Uh, significant changes. Um, coral reefs already very adversely affected by the changes we've already seen in that temperature more than anything else. But coral reefs are clearly one of the most vulnerable ecosystems in the world. They're sensitive to sea surface temperature. They're sensitive to a lesser degree of sea level rise. They're sensitive to ocean acidification. They're sensitive to land-based pollution. They're already in serious danger. And with these projected changes in temperature in the future, it is not, not unreasonable to say that coral reefs have a very low probability of surviving. What I like about this report is it did look at the full range of plausible temperature changes. The 1.5 degree uh, report looked at 1.5 degrees Celsius and 2. This report did look that we might potentially be on a much higher trajectory to a world that's 3, 4 and 5 degrees Celsius. And that's my personal view based on all the evidence we've got. The Paris Agreement is a superb agreement. The trouble is the current pledges are totally and utterly inadequate to meet a 1.5 world or a 2 degree world. We're much more likely to be on a pathway of 3 to 4 degrees world and this report actually plays out what are the implications of these higher changes in temperature and one of the most sensitive systems to these changes in temperature are indeed coral reefs when also affected by these other pressures as well. Since the 1980s, algae blooms, major range expansion, increased frequency. Um, I won't talk about fisheries, we're going to hear a much more profound talk in a few minutes basically. Um, there's no question that ocean acidification um, along with warming sea, uh, sea ice changes and extent continue loss of sea ice is really affecting the polar ecosystems in particular. Uh, it's one of the major issues that was talked at the Arctic Forum a couple of days ago. And of course, what it, and I'm sure you'll hear far more from the fisheries expert, and that is to what degree is this going to provide opportunities for now fishing in the Arctic region versus, as I said earlier, potential issues uh, that we have to look on that national security. But the key point that was talked about at that particular meeting and is raised in these reports is if one is now going to have far more exploitation of the natural resources that are now much more amenable to extraction, will it be done in a sustainable manner or will we continue in the totally unsustainable manner in the way we've exploited the world's oceans uh, to date, basically? And so fundamentally, uh, where are we? We're in trouble. It's very simple. Biodiversity is in trouble on the oceans, on land, everywhere. And these are not environmental issues. These are actually development issues. They're economic issues. They're security issues. They're moral issues. And they're, they're social issues. And in reality, the results are very similar, thank goodness, uh, to the IPBES report that we put out in May of this year. As we basically said, marine biodiversity is uh, impacted at an unprecedented rate by human activities. 
33% uh, of reef, coral, reef forming corals, sharks and shark relatives are all threatened now with extinction. Only 3% of the world's ocean is free from human pressure. 3% basically. Uh, globally fish and exploitation has had the biggest impact on marine biodiversity. But climate is likely to be the dominant driver in the next few decades, which is why we have to look at climate change and biodiversity as one single issue. They cannot be looked at anymore as two separable issues. We've got to get the conventions to work together. And the key issue on all of these things is these are issues that affect all government departments and the stovepiping of government departments and the stovepiping of UN of UN agencies means that we have a, we do not have have the right governance structures uh, to address these particular issues. And of course the other issue which comes out very nicely in this report is the emerging issue of plastics pollution, also a major threat to marine biodiversity. And with that all I can say is we need to act now. We should have acted 10, 20, 30 years ago. Hi. Good morning, everybody. I do have some slides. If it's possible to use them, that would be great. Um, so uh, thank you to WIT and to CSIS for the invitation. This is not my normal crowd. I come from NASA. Um, and so the, the very nature of what we do at NASA is that what's probably more well known are things like, um, you know, ex exploration of our solar system and beyond, the Mars rover. Okay. Thank you. Um, and then, of course, the more well-known Artemis program for looking at the moon and beyond. But we do also have part of our mission to explore the Earth, to understand the Earth, and to think about our observations, our models, and what we learn about the Earth in our research for not only basic and applied science, but for societal benefit. And we do this at NASA using an Earth-observing satellite fleet. Now, you may be thinking, what's the relevance to something like the IPCC report? We have 23 on-orbit missions, and as you can see from um, what's shown on the screen, a number of missions that are in formulation, in development, and some that have lasted long beyond their prime scheduled missions. And this becomes critical because if we actually want to look at the entire global Earth system and all of its aspects and look at the properties of the Earth system over time, then this is one way to do it. This is not the only way to do it. This is at a global scale and the partnership with the in-situ observations, which I have learned over time, sustained observations of anything are a very unsexy and difficult thing to sell. And where they come into play is when you have reports like the IPCC and you wanna reduce uncertainties in your models. You need observations to do it. So these observations, as well as what our in-situ partners do is absolutely critical. And we don't just use the um, low Earth orbit, we actually use our space station as well, okay? Owned and operated by a global community, peppered with Earth observing sensors, absolutely critical for getting a higher spatial, higher spectral, higher temporal resolution view of some of the Earth system. And this becomes very important when we think about reports like the IPCC. Now, I was tasked to talk to you about ocean production. And I, I wish that everybody in this room knew what that was or why they should care, but if you don't, I'm gonna tell you, okay? I'm gonna walk through this. The ocean has what's known as food chains and of course a food web. And they're shown here in these photos. And I was highly sensitive to this photo because it's from Encyclopedia Britannica and there I just dated myself. Probably half the room doesn't remember what that is. Um, if you look at the right-hand side, um, what you can look at are the producers right here on the bottom, the primary producers. In this case, we have a type of phytoplankton known as a dinoflagellate. Now, phytoplankton, what are they? Here are micrographs of, elect of uh, phytoplankton in the ocean, okay? These are the microscopic equivalent of land plants. Um, they go through and what's known as primary production through the process known as photosynthesis, where you take carbon dioxide and water in the presence of sunlight, and you produce organic carbon and oxygen. And that's as sciencey as I'm gonna get with you right now. 
But why is that important? Because you just heard about from Co and from Bob, and you will hear from Kathy as well, um, details about carbon dioxide and what that does to Earth's climate and the impacts of that on everything living and things not living, okay? And why humans should care in the economics. So let's get to that. Who cares, okay, about these tiny little microscopic plants in the ocean? Well, phytoplankton are about 1 100th of plant biomass. That's terrestrial plant biomass. Um, they conduct 50% of Earth's primary production with their biomass turning over in the ocean every two to six days. Now, how do you gauge change of something that turns over every two to six days, okay, and has that kind of impact on the global carbon cycle? It's challenging to observe, but it's possible. Phytoplankton mediate about one-third of human carbon dioxide emissions each year, okay? And now you should start to see even more why these organisms are very important in understanding our Earth system. So, the economics of it. I just did a simple Google search of some UN reports yesterday and came up with tidbits referenced in recent UN reports. Um, you'll hear more about this in a moment, but fisheries and aquaculture support about 12% of the world's livelihoods. The ocean contributes greater than $282 billion to the U.S. GDP. The commercial value of U.S. fisheries from just coral reefs, just coral reefs, exceeds $100 million. And the U.S. harmful algal bloom events, as you just heard about from Bob, um, have an average impact of about $50 million each year based on the region that they're located in, okay? When you start to translate those numbers, and I, can, I footnoted them all in my notes, I can give you the UN reports, um, that adds up to big business and why we should care even more deeply about something, not just for human well-being, but for our Earth system and our economics in general. Now, um, let's translate this even further. How do we do this from space? Some of the um, IPCC uh, analyses and modeling and conclusions are based on in situ as well as satellite data. And from space, this is what a phytoplankton bloom looks like, okay, right there. Um, the phytoplankton are responsible for going through photosynthesis and primary production, and this has a huge impact on regional and global carbon cycling. So it's these guys, again, at play, doing their thing, turning over every two to six days. Um, and remember, they, stay, they sustain higher trophic levels, so secondary production all the way up through fisheries and apex predators that humans are very familiar with and use for industry and economics, as well as sustenance, recreation, et cetera. Um, phytoplankton blooms, they change the color of the water. If there are more of them, you can see the water appeal, appears different colors, in this case greenish and milky white. Um, certain types of phytoplankton, which are indicators of climate change, such as coccolithophores and others, um, respond to different levels of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, which are taken up by the ocean. Um, along with physical observations, okay, we can see a tight coupling between something like primary production and the physical state of the ocean. So we observe these variables together as the report points to. And then we can get things that are outcomes of changing the Earth system, meaning shifts in ecological species and a carbon balance. Um, if you change one thing in the system, it's likely that something else in the system is going to respond, and understanding those responses allow us to adapt. And for example, in this case, something like a coccolithophore uh, bloom, which is shown here, can do things like reduce water clarity effects, and that has an impact on local ecosystems, birds, fisheries, et cetera. So now, taking it all home, what we can do at NASA is do sustained observations of the global ocean, okay, and the Earth system in general. So what you're seeing here in this still shot, this is a composite of September 1997 at the start of a mission known as CWIPS. Um, the color bar on the upper left-hand side shows you how much chlorophyll, which is a proxy for phytoplankton biomass, which is a major input to calculating production, is in the ocean. Um, the purples and darker blues are lower levels, and the greens and reds and yellows along the coast um, are the higher levels of phytoplankton. This can be coupled to something like the analog on the land, okay? In the upper right color bar, you see the land vegetation index. Now, where this becomes really powerful over time is that we can watch the Earth breathe, okay? So you are actually seeing monthly averages of what's going on in ocean phytoplankton biomass supporting uh, 
primary production, and what's going on on the land over time. You can look at the Arctic and the Antarctic. You can see the snow cover and the ice cover, okay? You can see a change over time. You can look at areas like Africa and see the greening going on. You can see the deserts in brown. Um, you can see the lows in the central gyres. You can see the response of the ocean to things like El Nino and La Nina when they occur in uh, 97 and 98 was a big one at the start of this animation. Um, you can see changes in biomass and phytoplankton at the lower levels. So when you start to take some of the impacts that Co has talked about and Bob has talked about with increased stratification, um, and you think about your phytoplankton in the ocean and production and how important it is, if you think of your houseplants at home, what do they need to grow? They need water, not so limiting in the ocean. They need sunlight and they need nutrients. And when you have effects like heating, warming, stratification, all of a sudden production becomes a real challenge and that's gonna affect your higher trophic levels. It's also gonna impact things like harmful algal blooms and where and when they occur. Uh, so it's a very dynamic system, and those changes over time are really important to identify with some critical observations. So, sorry, with that, I'll turn it over to Kathy to tell you more about fisheries. Thanks, Bob. All right. I also have slides. Um, hopefully they can get queued up. So I'm Kathy Mills. I'm a scientist at the Gulf of Maine Research Institute in Portland, Maine. And the Gulf of Maine is actually one of the fastest warming regions in the world's oceans. Since we sort of realized how rapidly the Gulf of Maine was warming, a lot of my research has focused on how these warming patterns are affecting fish populations, fisheries, and fishing communities. And I'm here today to share with you some of the experiences related to fisheries um, in the Northeast US and hopefully using these examples to demonstrate that the findings and the key messages that are coming out of the special report on oceans and cryosphere are not just far away and far into the future. They are messages that are relevant here and they're relevant now. We're already seeing a lot of these changes occurring in fisheries in the Northeast US. Um, so I am going to, in my talk today, attempt to highlight a few examples related to some of the key themes in this report. And I thought this report does an excellent job of highlighting some of the physical changes we're seeing in the ocean, particularly that the ocean is warming. Warming rates are increasing and marine heat waves are increasing in frequency. And then also calling out, and we've heard from a number of these speakers, how those changes are affecting the ecosystem through changes in species species um, patterns, ecosystem services, including fisheries, and how those affect people on the ground and, and communities. And then I will conclude with a little bit of touching on some of the challenges we're seeing in fishery management systems, governance, and adaptation challenges. So just to orient you to some of the warming that we are experiencing in the Gulf of Maine, this is a time series of our sea surface temperature anomalies back to the start of the satellite sea surface temperature record. And what you see here is that we have been experiencing a warming trend over time. The overall trend that I show in this figure is that the Gulf of Maine is warming about 0 0.04 degrees Celsius per year. That doesn't sound like a lot probably, but the global warming average for sea surface temperature is 0 0.01 degrees Celsius per year. So we're warming about four times faster, and in fact, faster than 99% of the rest of the world's oceans. And heat waves have also become something that we are seeing frequently in the Gulf of Maine, the northeast shelf of the United States. I think that um, in 2012, we experienced a major heat wave that spanned the Northwest Atlantic. And I think that our work around this heat wave was actually the first time the word heat wave was used in association with ocean and marine settings. And essentially during this event, we saw temperatures running two to three degrees warmer than the long-term average, all the way from Cape um, Hatteras in North Carolina over to Iceland and all the way north into the Labrador Sea. During that summer, the Gulf of Maine uh, experienced temperatures that were about three degrees warmer than the long-term average through that year. Um, and we've also seen heat wave events for substantial portions of 2016 and 2018 since that time. 
So the warming trend, as well as the heat waves, um, all have ramifications for species in the ecosystem. And I'm going to go through a few examples of changes that we're seeing to fish populations and what that means for fisheries in the region. The example I'm going to start with is Gulf of Maine cod. So cod has historically been a really important fishery. It's sort of the fishery at the heart of New England. It was the commodity that supported the colonial economy, and fishing on cod has persisted for centuries. Over that time, we have certainly experienced periods of overfishing on cod, but in recent years, the fishery management systems that we've put in place have really reined in overfishing, and what we have seen in more recent years, though, is that climate is throwing a new wrench into fishery management and introducing new challenges. So in the way that we do fisheries management, we um, take observations of fish in the ecosystem and put those together to try to develop an estimate of how large the population is. And with Gulf of Maine cod, this process doesn't typically account for environmental conditions. But with cod, what we've seen is that not accounting for temperature really led to major challenges in terms of how we assess the state of the stock and manage it and uh, allowable levels of fishing on that stock. So by not accounting for the rapid warming that we have seen in the Gulf of Maine, we were not picking up on declines in recruitment of cod that were tied to that warming trend. And we were assuming that the stock could be fished harder than it could in reality. So even though the management system was operating within the bounds of scientific information it was provided and fishers on the water were operating under those rules, the stock has been overfished in recent years because we aren't accounting for some of the major changes that are occurring in the ocean. When we look forward into the future under a variety of temperature scenarios, and here the warm scenario we're using is roughly equivalent to the RCP 8.5 temperatures, and the hot scenario is actually aligned with the temperature warming rates that we have been experiencing in the region in recent years. What we see is that when we project um, the population out to the future, under some temperature conditions, we do expect the stock to recover to what we consider a sustainable level, but that's with no fishing happening on the stock. And under the warmest condition that we simulated, which is on par with our recent warming rates, um, we actually can't recover this stock to what we would consider a sustainable level. So this points to both the need for um, considering how we keep temperatures within reasonable biological realms, which gets at mitigation needs, but then also how we manage to support stocks that are operating under different um, and new um, physical conditions. So the future of cod in the Gulf of Maine will depend both on fishing rates, fishing levels, and temperature. I also want to describe a little bit about our experiences with American lobster. So American lobster while the population in southern New England is declining. Did that help at all? <laughs> it's on? Okay. Well, I'll just keep going. Um, so hold it closer. Got it. All right. So we have seen contrasting patterns in the Gulf of Maine and southern New England. And through some modeling work that we've done, essentially what we're seeing in southern New England is that temperatures are exceeding thresholds that lobster can tolerate. So the actual temperatures that they are experiencing are contributing to the decline of that population. Whereas in the Gulf of Maine, we've really moved into a sweet spot of temperatures that are really encouraging lobster production right now. Um, so the Gulf of Maine is benefiting from this warming in terms of its ability to produce lobsters, but looking forward as temperatures continue to increase, that may not be the continued pattern.
And I do want to highlight, because it comes out in the special report on oceans and cryosphere, the interconnections between climate and non-climate factors. So in this work as well, we also looked at um, some of the management approaches that have been used for lobster in the different regions. In the Gulf of Maine, for over a century, there's been a practice of marking um, female lobsters that have eggs and throwing them back. So a, a strong conservation ethic to return these females so that they can continue producing future generations of lobster. And what we looked at was if we had not had that practice in the Gulf of Maine, but had applied that practice in southern New England, how would these populations look now? And what we see here essentially, do I have a pointer? Um, is that if the Gulf of Maine had fished on those larger female lobsters, the population would have been lower than it is in actuality. Whereas in southern New England, if those large um, female lobsters had been protected, the population could have been doing much better than it currently is. So these issues are intertwined and uh, need to be sort of factored together with one another. And I also, um, I don't have a slide for this, but since we have talked a bit about heat waves, I do want to mention that the 2012 heat wave that we experienced had major ramifications for the lobster fishery. During that year, the temperatures warmed up earlier than usual. Lobster landing started coming online really early, but what we saw was a breakdown in the supply chain beyond that point. So there wasn't capacity in place to truck the lobsters to processors. There um, was an overlap between the American American and Canadian lobster season that year. So it resulted in a glut of product sitting on the market. And in fact, a backlog even at the processing stage that led to a major price collapse. And this was an event that really triggered a change in the conversation around what's going on with warming and climate change in New England. And so I do want to highlight that even though I don't have it in my slides. Um, and then the last example I want to offer you is that we are experiencing changes in species distributions. In general, many species in the Northeast are moving northward and to deeper waters as they try to track um, cooler temperatures. This is affecting fisheries as well. So here I'm showing you in the map um, a figure for where summer flounder are being caught. And what you see in blue is essentially that in the 1990s, summer flounder were being caught off of North Carolina and Virginia. How, however, in the around 2010, those summer flounder catches were taking place off of New Jersey and Long Island. So the fishery has shifted as the stock has shifted. And this type of pattern playing out across many species is also the uh, also creates the potential that new opportunities could arise as species move into waters that they haven't previously occupied. But this is where how we govern fisheries comes into play. So for summer flounder and for several species along the east coast of the US, we use a process where the overall allowable catch is proportioned out to states. So states um, are given certain shares of the quota based on their historical landings in the fishery. For summer flounder, these levels were set based on landings in the 1980s. And we didn't design a system that would plan for change in the future. We use similar types of systems for multinational arrangements for sharing the, sh the catch um, between countries. So this is a system that is currently um, sort of breaking down as we see shifts in fisheries or shifts in species. And it has a lot of implications for adaptation um, to changes that are occurring. So I'm going to end just with a few comments related to um, one focus place, Stonington, Maine. Stonington is the most valuable port in Maine right now. It lands 50 to 60 million dollars worth of lobster every year. And most of the landings there are indeed just lobster, about 99% of the landings. In Stonington, what we see when we look to the future is that we expect those lobster, um, the availability of lobster to decline by about 20%. There are new species moving in, like black sea bass and long fin squid. So really the future of Stonington as a fishing community will be shaped by the ability to tap into some of the resources that are moving into waters that they currently fish. And that gets back to our ability to create governance arrangements that would support that adaptation. But I do want to highlight that the future of Stonington is not just about its ability to adapt to fisheries on the water. 
Looking at the prospect for a 20% decline in lobster has major ramifications for the tax base of this place. Um, at the same time that they're confronting a variety of adaptation needs and infrastructure investments. One of the issues is sea level rise, particularly because Stonington is connected to the mainland by a low-lying causeway. So the future of fisheries in Stonington isn't just about adjusting to the species available. It's also going to be tied to the ability to preserve shoreside infrastructure and the transportation network. And so thinking about adaptation in more holistic manners that doesn't silo issues, uh, and integrating those together, I think, is a realm that we haven't really tackled in our approach in the past, and it's an approach that we need to invest in much more heavily moving forward. So thank you. Thanks, Kathy. Um, we've uh, our late bell mics on. So <clears throat> we had a <clears throat> really great, compelling conversation about uh, what the IPCC report has to say with regard to uh, coming impacts and about how those impacts translate into ecosystem change. And uh, I wanted to touch on a little bit uh, something I think that um, is there but maybe gets lost in the dynamic of conversation around different pathways, mitigation pathway, uh, business as usual pathway. And, that's that even under the most optimistic scenario, uh, we've really locked ourselves into decades and in some cases centuries of change, depending on the kind of factor that we're talking about. And so I guess this is a, a question just to the panel generally, which is maybe you could comment a little bit about on how we've moved beyond the steady state and how, uh, from your perspective, we're going to continue to see change even under the most optimistic scenario and what that might look like uh, in the coming decades. And I'll, I'll just ask anybody who wants to to sort of take a stab at that. Well, as I said, um, the Paris Agreement, which was endorsed by literally every country in the world, including the US, is on paper a superb agreement. It argues that we should keep global warming to less than 2 degrees Celsius and try and achieve 1.5. Unfortunately, all the evidence is such that we're not on that pathway now, that we are clearly on a pathway to 3 to 4 degrees Celsius. Even a 1.5 or a 2 degree world has significant impacts on marine biodiversity, fisheries and the terrestrial system. We're focusing here on the ocean, but the terrestrial implications of a 1.5 and 2 degree world are still quite bad, a 3 to 4 degree world. Therefore, we have to put as much effort on adaptation to these changes as we do uh, to mitigating change. But we've really got to get government working with the private sector, working with civil society, to realise that there are incredible opportunities for transformational change to make our carbon system low carbon, to try to get close to the Paris Agreement. But as I say, we equally at the same time have to learn how to adapt to a change in climate. And I think this is going to be a real challenge, to be quite candid. Um, in bio biodiversity terms, ecological terms, it's the rate of change that's going to make adaptation so incredibly hard. Not just the magnitude, but the rate of change. And we're going to see further changes lost in both terrestrial biodiversity and in marine biodiversity. And as I've said, the problem is these are not simply uh, environmental issues. I, in some ways, I wish they were. These are development issues. They affect, f uh, they affect food, water security, human health, migration patterns of people being displaced by sea level rise around the world. So you bring in social conflict, even potentially armed conflict. So we really do need to recognize that economic issues as well. Climate change causes significant economic costs, actually. Loss of biodiversity causes economic loss. And as they say, it's a security issue. So I think the challenge in front of us, however, what I would say is I think most governments do now realize this where we're failing is implementation because of vested interests uh, trying to control and like the status quo that we have today. But we also have to think across government departments. 
all government departments have to work together on these issues, all UN agencies, and we have to work with the private sector. So it's a major challenge, but it's doable. Both IPCC and IPBES, we've laid down what are the technologies, what are the policy changes, uh, evolution of an economic system, basically, getting rid of perverse subsidies in transportation, energy, fisheries, for example. So it's doable. We just need to have the political will. I would also add, building off of your comment about the rate of change and its importance for biodiversity, I think the rate of change is also the real sort of key element for adaptation of human systems as well. I mean, we see that in many cases, people can cope with change, but only to a certain point. And being able to move beyond that, I think um, humans only have the capacity to adjust so quickly in terms of how they do things. And we really need to think about putting governance and management systems in place that can inherently accommodate the dynamics of the ecosystem um, without needing to renegotiate the terms of an agreement every single time there is a change. I think we're moving into a new era where um, we're seeing change happen so quickly that building systems that inherently accommodate that change is going to be really important moving forward. I think that's a great point. It's one I kind of wanted to get to. You talked about how our management structures here in the U.S., where we have the best managed fisheries in the world, quite frankly, mm -hmm. uh, are not able to account for a dynamic environment where we have fisheries not just migrating. It's not like they're migrating to an endpoint. They are going to continue to move as the climate continues to change in the coming decades. So <clears throat> to your point, the idea that we need to build systems and institutions that are themselves dynamic, are able to deal uh, not just in a steady state sort of way, but with the changing status quo. Mm -hmm. That's right. Um, Bob, you talked a lot about uh, biodiversity uh, and, and how that uh, climate is going to become the, the biggest driver for biodiversity loss in the coming decades. Can you talk a little bit about the feedback loop between biodiversity and resilience to change and sort of how there's there's a, a, a real negative impact, not just from the loss of biodiversity on existing ecosystem services, but on the ability to withstand change. I'm not quite sure what you're looking at, but there's no question that as we're losing biodiversity, we are losing resilient systems. There's no question at all about that, both terrestrial biosphere and the marine biosphere, that these are fragile systems. And the problem is, once you lose biodiversity, it's irreplaceable, basically. So we've, I mean, what, this is obviously both marine and terrestrial, but in IPBES, we actually said that one million species out of eight million species were at threat of extinction. That's a huge number. It's not a sixth mass extinction like a lot of people say it is, because on that, we lost 75% of species in the historical past. But the trouble is, as you lose individual species, you change the interaction between the species, and it actually very much changes the dynamics, the resilience of the systems, the ecosystem services they provide to us human, human people. And so we have to basically try to see how do you keep these ecosystems intact People tend to fo focus a lot on individual species, but the big challenge is keeping the ecosystems intact, uh, especially terrestrial ecosystems. So fundamentally, we have a major challenge. But as I've said, there are practices and technologies that can address these issues in a fairly straightforward way. Can, can I just add, Please. I mean, there really <coughs> is a moral dilemma here as well. I, in my day job, um, I have a program under my jurisdiction that's based on, it looks at ocean exploration. We are still discovering new species, mm. you know, every time we go out with a, you know, an exploration um, tour. So um, the disruption to the systems that we still don't even fully understand is, I think, a travesty that has to be considered. Excellent. Thank you. Um, we have a few minutes for some audience questions, and so I guess do we have mics? So what I'd like to do is actually, given that we have a sh relatively short period of time for the coffee break, maybe we could take, uh, let's say, three questions, and we'll go to the panel with those three questions, try and keep them brief uh, and, and as much to a, a question as possible. Um, so I see one person up here, uh, two people up here, and is there a third? One over there. And then one over there. So Ty, maybe you could pass the mic around. Thank you. Appreciate it. Good morning, everyone. My name is Lingxing. I'm a graduate student from- It's not on. Is this better? 
Yeah, okay, Thank beautiful. Um, I'm a graduate student from Johns Hopkins University studying engineering and international relations. Thank you very much for your sharing. And there's a very insightful point during your um, discussion about how this climate uh, change is a systematic manner. And one of you mentioned how political governments can make a big difference. But here's my question. Please bear with me. I, I'm just curious to know, and I want to push forward a little bit. Like, instead of discussing the impacts, uh, maybe you, you already have the solutions and approaches to address this problem. But is it possible that we can utilize what poses as challenge right here into actually an advantage? Let's say because the heat waves, right, is one of the biggest uh, negative impact that comes along with the um, climate global warming. But is it possible that we can transfer this thermal um, energy into something that okay as a usable energy and also because also this lady she mentions at the NASA's there uh, NASA there would be lots of work on the um, plants or you know like ba uh, bacteria uh, bacteria like a microwave you know like the agents that can transform the carbon dioxide and the sunlight into the oxygen and the carbohydrate complexes. So with the emerging synthetic biology and gene editing techniques as well, is it possible that we can you know, utilize some of the bacteria or the plants that is sensitive to this heat or sensitive to this warming um, temperature you know, to actually to do something good and transfer all this carbon dioxide into the oxygen? Thank you. Okay, great. Maybe you can pass it. Yes. <coughs> Tie right up here in the front. I'm Steve Parks, a uh, retired physicist. Uh, I've been uh, looking at the, uh, the uh, regulatory issues about surrounding the littoral zones and how development processes in both Europe and the U.S. and probably everywhere else uh, has put a great deal of pressure on the nursery areas where pelagic fishes uh, fry, develop, and uh, how, how does this affect the fisheries, and what do you think can be done to enhance the preservation of these, because the rising <coughs> sea levels will push the uh, marshlands back but the cities will, will block that progress. <coughs> and uh, so you'll end up with uh, some limitations and reduction of those marshlands. Okay, thank you. And then one more over here. Uh, thank you, Matthew Kupchik. I'm a AAAS SDP fellow at USAID. Um, you spoke on, on the need to come up with transformative ways to manage our fisheries better, essentially, in light of these challenges. And I know there's been a push to ecosystem-based management of fisheries, going back to this thing. But if we're actually changing the baselines and we're changing the distributional ranges, how do we then basically have a moving system, right? The, 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 the ecosystem's yeah, moving exactly. across the, 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 the space. And you're going to have to have a management system then that has to go transboundary, dealing with Absolutely. Maybe even rethinking Absolutely. the law of the sea and the EEZ yep. to be able to, to come to those challenges. If you could speak to that, that'd be great. Thank you. Thank you. So, uh, really good question. So, I'm going to just summarize quickly. I think we had one about the opportunities. There's always winners and losers in any uh, changing system uh, coming with climate change. One about the challenge uh, having to do with, I think I'm going to summarize it by saying the loss of coastal ecosystems and the tension between the need to adapt. Uh, coastal infrastructure and, and, and the loss of coastal ecosystems and the impacts that will have. And then the third, which is diving a little more into the nature of, of the challenges around building a dynamic management system, especially when it, it, it comes with uh, international uh, and intergovernmental relationships. So toss that to the panel. Anybody can dive in on any one of those? Um, well, I can probably start on the engineering and you know, physics is sort of where I sit. But the, um, I, I, every time that there's a, you know, a report, uh, an assessment, a recommendation, an idea about um, engineering of some sort coming mm. to the rescue of any sort of climate challenge, we read it with great interest. Now, NASA is not mm -hmm. a policy institution, right? We're, we're more on the R&D side and engineering side. But there have been reports on you know, geoengineering. Can we do things with it? People study biofuels. People study all sorts of alternatives. And I think it's good to encourage that. Mm 
I have yet to see you know, a proposed idea or solution that really understands um, the Earth system or an ecosystem as a whole and takes every aspect into account before implementing everything. Um, it's kind of like, you know, before you flip that switch that you may not be able to flip back and changing something or introducing a species into an ecosystem that may ultimately decimate it for a short-term fix. Um, I think we have to have a better understanding of all the aspects of an ecosystem and what the long-term um, uh, implications of something like that is. Because you can draw, you know, you can um, dump a bunch of iron into the ocean, draw down CO2, but most models show it's back in the atmosphere within 40 or 50 years. Okay, so short-term fix, um, you know, long-term problem. I don't know if... Uh, Kathy? Do you want to, I saw you uh, thinking a little bit about some of the, the management system issues. I can comment on the fishery questions. The first question, I'm glad that Paula could tackle the <laughs> physics of that. Um, so I think that, you know, to the couple of questions related to fish, um, obviously the question about nursery habitats is really important. Um, yeah. We recognize that those are sort of in critical habitat areas for many fish species that do then go on to either provide important prey in the ecosystem or to support fisheries directly. I would say, and this is something I've been interested in for a while but haven't been able to move down the path of, that um, we don't have a lot of information on how that habitat area and quality scales up to a population level and the ramifications beyond that. So without that framework in place, it's really hard to determine if you see changes in aggregate area or location of different areas, how that will affect populations at a higher level. And so I think this is a, a science gap that will be an important area to address moving forward, particularly as we see distributions changing as well. Do you guys want to add anything to that one? No, I'm fishing. All right. What about the idea that international institutions need to, need to adapt? So we, international institutions need to adapt and, and how, we, how we think about uh, our relationships across EEZs and, and across boundaries? Well, there's no question whether it's a climate change issue or biodiversity issue, and as I say, I think they're one issue now. We need institutions and organizations to adapt both nationally and internationally. There's no question whatsoever about that. We don't have the right institutional organizational structures at either the national level or the international level. So when we say transformative change is needed, one of those transformative changes is in governance structures, basically. But the basic problem is there's no trust. There's limited trust between governments, developed and developed, let alone developed and developing, limited trust between governments and the private sector and the NGOs. And still, until we all recognize we have a major challenge for the survival of Earth, and we need to work together, we're not going to address these issues, to be quite honest. So trust and building trust is going to be a crucial issue. One quick question on the geoengineering of biofuels. Another reason we have to look at climate change and biodiversity, literally every large-scale climate model that says we have a chance of getting to 1.5 or 2 degrees Celsius relies very heavily on using bioenergy, mm -hmm. often coupled with what's called carbon capture and storage. Mm -hmm. The trouble is, if you do go to large-scale monoculture bioenergy, it potentially could threaten biodiversity if you're replacing a monoculture, a native forest or native grassland with a monoculture, or if you encroach on arable land, you threaten food and water security, which is why you need to look at the issues together. Some bioenergy can be good, but it has to be handled carefully. We have to look at the synergies and the trade-offs in all of the solution space, both technologies, policies, and practice between issues such as climate change and the UN Sustainable Development Goals. All of these are coupled together. They can't be looked at one at a time. And on the geoengineering, we need to do a lot more research to understand the potential benefits and the potential risks. And we clearly should not be trying to geoengineer a world that we can't even understand at the moment. <laughs> Great. Well, thank you guys so much. I'd like to break there for our, our coffee break. Make sure we do have some time to, to get some coffee. Thank you all. Really appreciate you joining us here today. And I look forward to getting to some uh, of these questions in the next panel as well. So thank you. Thank you.
Coming back uh, promptly from the coffee break, I really appreciate it. And um, thanks again to our first panel, really enjoyed the, the conversation. So uh, I think we're gonna pick up a little bit on, on some of the themes from the end of that conversation around this idea of, of a dynamic world and what that means now in the policy and the security space. So I'm really excited to have an excellent panel to talk about that. Uh, we've got Heather Conley, who's our Vice President for Europe, Eurasia, and the Arctic. We've got John Mimikakis, who is the Vice President for Oceans at the Environmental Defense Fund. We've got Sarah Glasser, who is the Deputy Director of Secure Fisheries. And we've got uh, Amy Lair, who is the Director of our Human Rights Initiative here at CSIS. So again, thank you to the panel. And I'm going to uh, sit down and be quiet and turn it over to my excellent panel. Uh, and we'll start off with Heather. Well, Whit, thank you so much. Good morning, everyone. I think the Arctic is the best place to talk about that intersection of climate stress and security. Um, and in many ways, the Arctic is telling us, actually both polar regions are telling us that they are under the most dramatic stress, as the Arctic certainly is warming two to three times faster than any place on the planet. And in many ways, we are now dealing with a very new ocean. In fact, our former uh, Coast Guard Commandant, Admiral Zunkoff, called the Arctic America's fourth coast. And I thought that was such a powerful way of thinking about it, in part because many Americans do not know the United States as an Arctic nation, to help bring it home to this is homeland security. Uh, we now have a new coast that requires our protection. And so that is what, in many ways, the, the nexus between the rapid diminishment of the Arctic uh, polar ice cap is now creating new borders, new coasts to protect. Uh, which is why we need uh, enhanced Coast Guard presence. Certainly that's through uh, the uh, enhanced icebreaker uh, component, uh, what we call a polar security cutter. Um, but this was also require deep water ports, greater mar uh, maritime domain awareness because we are now seeing an increase in commercial and human activity um, in the Arctic. It is also this new ocean and the opportunities that this new ocean provides uh, is really uh, requiring a much more a rethought, I, I would argue, about sovereignty in the Arctic. And this is certainly the Russian government's perspective uh, because they are now, Russia is now uh, developing a very ambitious economic development plan for the Russian Arctic which not only includes the development of oil and gas resources in the Russian Arctic, but also the creation of a major transit route, the Northern Sea Route. And so what we're seeing is Russia needing to enhance the protection of the Northern Sea Route. They're reopening airfields, they're putting search and rescue centers across the Northern Sea Route, uh, and they are also making important changes uh, to uh, the structure and how they regulate the Northern Sea Route. And of course, what underpins all of this, uh, uh, both the science and the environmental change that we're seeing in the Arctic, as well as the economics, it's all underpinned by science. Science is power in the Arctic. Using traditional knowledge of the indigenous communities is power. Um, and of course, we're trying to understand the science behind the extraordinary changes that we are seeing in the Arctic. So I'm just gonna touch on some of the key security issues. It's sort of the good, the bad, and the ugly, if you will. Um, and there is some very good things that are happening in the Arctic to manage this nexus between climate stress and security. First and foremost, I think at this point, the Arctic is well governed. The United Nations uh, Convention of the Law of the Sea provides that maritime space with good legal frameworks for territorial waters, exclusive economic zones, as well as the high seas area around the North Pole, the Central Arctic Ocean. And one of the most important forms of monitoring and, and innovating uh, governing the Arctic is through the Arctic Council, that intergovernmental forum that was created in 1996. It was birthed from an Arctic environmental protection strategy that brings the five coastal states together, Russia, Canada, Norway, Denmark, uh, the Kingdom of Denmark via Greenland, and of course the United States, plus Iceland, Sweden, and Finland. But what's so important about the Arctic Council that sort of gets missed uh, is that at the center of the Arctic Council are the indigenous communities, the permanent participants. 
they have a seat at the table because it's their way of life that is so dramatically changing. But the Arctic Council has been sort of groaning under the changes, both of the, the climate change and the new demands on it. Uh, right now, there are 20 plus observers to the Arctic Council. In 2013, China became a permanent observer to the Arctic Council, and I would argue that very much changed the dynamic. Uh, now the Arctic is not just for those regional countries. Uh, it is now becoming a global issue because what happens in the Arctic impacts the global environment. And as China's role became more and more apparent in the Arctic and Russia began to assert itself increasingly, both militarily and economically in the Arctic, now we're at a point where we're, we're viewing the Arctic through the lens of great power competition. And that was certainly framed by uh, Secretary of State Mike Pompeo in Finland uh, in May of this year, where he gave a real stem winder of a speech, sort of surprised some of us uh, where it came from, describing this very stark uh, great power competition in the Arctic. And so that's in some ways what we're grappling with today. China's growing economic presence uh, through infrastructure, uh, through its participation in a variety of international organizations, uh, and of course Russia's increased uh, military presence. These are challenging how the U.S. thinks about it. But I always want to end with good news because so often in our line of work we're just talking about challenges. Uh, I want to say I, uh, the Arctic has also demonstrated great resilience and in governance innovation. When we needed to strengthen uh, the, the, the maritime shipping code in the Arctic, the International Maritime Organization, it took it a decade, created the Polar Code, which strengthens uh, demands and mandates that ships must be uh, hardened uh, for traversing the Arctic. We've created an international search and rescue agreement, an international oil spill and response agreement. We just recently negotiated a preemptive fisheries agreement for the Central Arctic Ocean. There are no fish in the Central Arctic Ocean, but this agreement puts a moratorium on that for 16 years until the science tells us uh, that it could be okay if we needed to do that. Uh, we have innovations like the Arctic Coast Guard Forum, which helps do that search and rescue, that oil spill response. And finally, something that Whit and I have been looking at is getting to that high seas challenge to protect the biodiversity beyond the national jurisdictions, beyond the exclusive economic zones that's targeting those high seas area, fisheries, biodiversity, shipping. You know what, it's a little chaotic right now. I don't think we have it all exactly the right place. I'm very worried about the military dimension. I'm worried about China's dual use uh, infrastructure in the Arctic, but I'm very heartened when I see innovation, pragmatic governance that's helping to protect the Arctic. So I wanna end on a high note, but looking forward to your questions. Thanks, Good. Whit. Thank you, Heather, that's, that's great. Um, so we're gonna turn now from the Arctic to uh, Asia and the Pacific, and I'm gonna to turn to John. Thanks, Whit. Um, so uh, Asia is uh, very much a crucible for climate change uh, and security. Um, if you think about it, it's got two thirds of the global population. Uh, many of those are poor populations. Uh, they live coastally uh, predominantly. They rely heavily on seafood uh, for uh, nutrition. Um, uh, there's already uh, over-exploitation of those fishing resources and that over-exploitation is intensifying. Um, the governments typically have low capacity to deal with those issues. And then these, uh, in Southeast Asia especially, uh, these are the countries that are going to be hit hardest uh, by climate change where some of those impacts will be felt the greatest. Um, to talk about this and put this in a little bit of context, I want to use uh, Indonesia as an example. I'll start with that and then I'll try to, to, to back up a little bit. So Indonesia <clears throat> um, is the second largest uh, fishing power in the world in, in terms of uh, amount of wild fish harvested. China is the first, obviously, Indonesia is second. Uh, but it's a country that struggled uh, with poverty. It has about a 10% uh, poverty rate. Um, uh, of its 270 million people, 10% uh, live below the poverty line, which Indonesia is about 76 cents uh, a day. Um, the uh, fishing is often referred to as a last resort occupation. When ag uh, agriculture and other jobs don't work out, you can just go fishing. Um, uh, and so many of these coastal communities depend upon fish uh, for nutrition uh, and for 
uh, and to climb out of poverty. Uh, as, uh, and if, you, uh, if, you're, if you're not certain how important fisheries are to Indonesia, Google uh, Minister Susi Pujiastuti, and I'm sure you will uh, pull up a, uh, a photograph of, of the, uh, the boats, the fishing boats that have illegally traversed into Indonesia fishing waters that, uh, that she's blown up literally and it made her, uh, it's made her one of the most popular uh, politicians in Indonesia today. Um, as an example of the role that fisheries play, um, I can tell you a little bit about a blue swimming crab fishery that uh, EDF works in there. Um, it's the third most uh, important uh, export commodity economically, uh, uh, swimming crab. If you go to the Chesapeake here and you order a crab cake sandwich, uh, chances are the local, uh, local supply can't really keep up with the demand, so chances are very, very good that you are eating uh, blue swimming crab from Indonesia. Um, and perhaps one from the, uh, from the Java Sea. 80% 80, 80 of the product there goes to the U.S. Um, there are about 300 people uh, in that fishery uh, in terms of fishermen and, uh, and supply chain workers there, uh, and it brings in the country about 300 million U.S. dollars. So 300,000 uh, people, $300 million, if you do the math, that keeps these people just above that poverty line, but only hovering just above it. So they remain very vulnerable. Uh, climate change uh, impacts will be very serious uh, for communities like these. Um, obviously, sea level rise. Uh, some of these communities not, are not just coastal. Uh, there is a uh, there is a fishing village uh, that uh, that we work with that is literally built on a sandbar about 10 kilometers from shore with uh, sticks sort of put down in the in the uh, in the sand and, and there's a platform and. Uh, women and children, but mostly uh, fishermen are, are there and they live there uh, year-round so they can get further uh, access uh, to the fishery. Obviously, sea level rise is, is going to be extremely, extremely challenging. Um, uh, but the losses in productivity that you heard about in the, in the first panel, uh, what we heard globally, uh, uh, the earth, you know, global fish production may decline by about 4% or so. Uh, but regionally, uh, losses in the developing tropics in places like Indonesia could decline by as much as 50%. Uh, and that's both because of the loss in fundamental productivity uh, that the previous speakers talked about, and also because of fish migrating uh, to cooler waters uh, and poleward, northward and, uh, and, and southward. Um, so this is, of course, uh, potentially catastrophic uh, for these poor communities that are hovering on the poverty line. Um, and, and this generates a, um, this will create a potentially uh, downward spiral. So if there's a loss of catch, um, the res logical response for most communities is to then fish harder. Uh, that then makes um, these fisheries even more vulnerable to climate change. So there's a very interesting link to understand here, and it's talked about in the report. Uh, overfished fisheries are more vulnerable to climate change. And climate change, of course, will have a negative impact on fisheries. So these communities uh, that experience drops in catches uh, will then make their own resources more vulnerable by overfishing. The governments uh, in many of these places have little capacity to control that. Um, and so these communities uh, have the potential to spiral downward. Another response to declining catches will be for fishermen to go further and further abroad. Already, many Indonesian fishermen go right up to the border of the EEZ of Australia and they fish right along the line uh, because Australia's fisheries are well, fairly well managed and Indonesian fishermen just sort of get the benefits right over the border. And I'm not trying to pick on Indonesia. We've seen China do the same thing as their domestic fisheries have dropped. Uh, they've uh, increased uh, the, the, uh, the power and number of uh, distant water fleet uh, boats. Um, and this, of course, creates huge uh, challenges in Asia where the EEZs are packed in uh, so, so tightly uh, that it'll create uh, a, a lot of potential for tensions to grow among uh, countries. Um, so turning to solutions, uh, what can we do about this? Uh, it, the number one solution, of course, is to mitigate uh, climate change, uh, to reduce uh, carbon pollution and global warming pollution, number one. Uh, since we're on an ocean theme, number two, I would say, is to uh, uh, promote low carbon energy, uh, wind energy, uh, wave energy, perhaps thermal uh, water energy as well. Uh, solutions that promote blue carbon. Um, uh, it's, it's the, the report talks uh, well, speaks well to the issue of uh, mangroves, salt marshes, seagrasses, uh, 
Um, but there's also the carbon that's found in uh, increasing fish stocks, uh, re reviving those to historic levels. There was a paper I saw recently by some economists that estimated that if you could replenish whale populations, whale populations alone to pre-fished levels, that's two gigatons of carbon. Um, so that's a pretty startling number. Uh, another potential way to mitigate is to eat more fish. This may sound a little controversial. We can talk about it in the Q&A. But uh, uh, beef, beef uh, is about 20 times uh, more emissions per gram of protein uh, in a life cycle analysis than, uh, than seafood. OK, but critically, as we heard in the last panel, uh, we cannot just mitigate, we also need to adapt and manage. And this is a really uh, urgent issue uh, because of this linked link between uh, uh, fisheries abundance and resiliency. We really, uh, it's urgent that we put in place uh, good fisheries management in these countries that lack it. Uh, so this is a food security issue. So number one, we need to build capacity in these countries that don't have the skills, finances, or expertise or experience to put in place management. Uh, and number two, we need to strengthen international agreements because if, as these fish migrate, uh, the countries th uh, uh, that host fish that are leaving uh, have every incentive to fish those populations down before they get across the border. And uh, the, the countries that might receive the fish are not going to want that to happen. So there really needs to be uh, what we know again and again from uh, observing fisheries around the world. When there's unmanaged competition, it leads to a decline in the fish population. So there really needs to be a new effort to uh, strengthen these international agreements. There are many international agreements on fisheries. Uh, almost none of them contain climate uh, provisions. Uh, and then lastly, uh, we need to develop solutions uh, for some of these local communities, uh, like aquaculture, uh, blue carbon and perhaps uh, some energy solutions as well. So there needs to be new, new solutions like that that can provide income and nutrition uh, for these communities. There is hope. Um, there are good examples. Uh, Witt earlier mentioned that the U.S. fisheries are one of the best managed in the world. It's one of the greatest conservation success stories I think that almost no one's heard of is the turnaround in U.S. fisheries. So management really can lead to fisheries rebounding. It's not just the U.S., of course. Uh, Australia has done this. New Zealand has done this. Namibia, uh, Chile, and Peru. There are good examples around the world of solutions that can work to rebuild fish populations. And again, this increases resiliency of the oceans to climate change. Uh, in Asia, there is some hope as well. Japan, uh, last December, passed its most significant reforms to its fishing law since World War II. Uh, and even China has now been implementing some pretty dramatic reforms to control overfishing and overexploitation of aquaculture in its domestic waters. Uh, so there's a lot happening. Uh, if, uh, if countries gather together, I think, and promote aid to these countries to build capacity uh, and can share their experiences, uh, can share their experts, their technical expertise, and uh, most importantly, share their financial resources, I think there's hope to, uh, to avoid the worst of climate change for these uh, countries in Southeast Asia. Excellent, thank you. Sarah, maybe you can talk, talk a little bit about uh, <clears throat> the Indo and Indo-Pacific and maybe uh, East Africa. Uh, yes, thank you. Um, I'm, I'm talking primarily about Africa and the Indian Ocean. Um, and I think John provided an ex excellent segue into what is happening in countries around Africa and um, the adaptive capacity that needs to be built. That, I, I agree completely that in um, countries that are facing the most extreme impacts from global warming and climate change, their physical c consumption of resources is not the driving factor. And so there's a real mismatch between the drivers of climate change and those in the world who will face the greatest impacts. And the new special report makes that quite clear by um, showing that the greatest impacts are going to be in the tropical latitudes, Arctic's as well, but when we're talking about the number of people who live in given areas, the tropics are really facing a disproportionate um, impact from climate change compared to other parts of the world and so some of the mid-latitude regions. So we just wanted to give three examples of recent impacts of climate change that are happening in Africa. The first was um, tropical cyclone Ide. It was essentially the um, Hurricane Dorian of East Africa. It happened in March of 2019. Over 1,300 people were killed in Mozambique and several of the other countries around there, although Mozambique was hit the hardest. Currently, they estimate over $2 billion worth of damage. Um, and those type of events are made worse, as we know, by climate change. But they destroy the, the resilience of communities there. We've talked a lot about ecological resilience, but community resilience is extremely important. And I think the, the, the good news is that that's something that we have a much greater 
ability to impact. Um, the second example is what's happening in Lake Chad in Central Africa between Chad and Nigeria. That lake has lost 90% of its water volume over the past 15 years. Now that's not solely due to climate change and warming, it's also due to irrigation and other factors, but that illustrates the complexity of the problems we're facing. The way that we deal with lands creates positive feedbacks that make the impacts of climate warming even worse. And in the area of Lake Chad in particular, the changes that are being seen in fishing communities and um, different agricultural communities that rely on rain-fed water and the lake for ir irrigation um, have created such um, levels of, of poverty, food insecurity, and livelihood insecurity that this area is now becoming um, a bit of a recruitment or breeding ground for violent extremism. Again, there's not one direct line between climate change and violent extremism or even between poverty and violent extremism. I wish it were that simple. But these issues are, are innately connected to one another. And the third example I'll mention is the ongoing drought in the Horn of Africa, which is a terrestrial impact. But given the monsoon seasons, given the amount of of ocean upwelling that happens around the Horn of Africa, in Somalia in particular, the drought that has been happening there for the past several years that has resulted in the displacement of millions of people internally um, and has recently put millions of children at risk from um, drought impacts is made worse by climate warming. So this is what um, Africa and the Indian Ocean are facing right now as a consequence of carbon emissions. So part B of the special report um, looked specifically at the projected risks for people and ecosystems. And one thing that is in incredibly valuable that the IPCC report does is puts levels of confidence around things. And I wish that those of us who look at the human impacts could be as confident in what we think the impacts will be as um, the people who study the physics and the biology. Um, unfortunately, it's just not a simple math equation. And so there's a lot lower levels of confidence around what we expect those impacts to be on communities. But that's where the opportunity exists. And that's because we have the ability to impact through governance, through policy changes, the way that human beings, through their own free will, make um, changes in relation to their own behavior. Um, that being said, I want to put a pin in that and say it, it cannot be, it must be incumbent on those of us in developed countries who are creating the most amount of carbon emissions to not require or, or rely on developing countries to be the ones who fix our problems. We need to enable them and provide capacity and technical expertise, but it cannot be on developing countries in Africa throughout the tropical Indo-Pacific to fix the problems that we've created. So I think there are three primary mechanisms that I see in Africa and the Indian Ocean that are linking climate change to conflict and greater security issues in the maritime realm. The first is direct competition for finite and mobile resources. And several speakers have already touched very nicely with very good examples of the movement of fish, the changes in EEZs. There was a great question from the audience about um, EEZ boundaries. Those boundaries will change slightly, but with sea level rise. But in Africa alone, there are 12 different maritime disputes over um, economic, exclusive economic zone boundaries, which extend from the shoreline out to 200 nautical miles. In Southeast Asia, they overlap quite a lot. In Africa, in West Africa, there's a lot of overlap as well and a lot of contention. But these EEZ boundaries are the definition of where governance over the marine resources for a given country belongs to the domain of that given country. Now that country can choose to sell off access to oil exploration, mineral exploration, fisheries exploitation, and governments, especially in Africa, earn a lot of revenue by selling some of those rights. But those, the access to those resources is going to change under scenarios of climate warming. My colleagues um, at One Earth Future have done research on what causes conflict, oftentimes violent conflict over fish, and it's direct access to the resource coupled with and made worse by declining fish populations and unclear maritime boundaries. Not just maritime, but also the boundaries that exist in inland oceans, or in inland waters. So the second primary ne mechanism linking climate change to conflict is changes in food and livelihood security. And, and several of our speakers have talked about that, but I wanna dig in a little bit more on what we mean by food security in relation to marine resources. Food security is defined as the predictable and reliable access to affordable and nutritional forms of food. So three key words there, predictable, so that people can plan their lives and livelihoods, um, affordable and nutritious. 
And seafood is some of the most nutritious food that we have, low in fats, high in omega-3s, and really importantly, high in micronutrients that are important for childhood development and brain development. And so when you're talking about nutrition at a child's level, you're talking about setting the stage for generations of people to come. And access to seafood, and I would agree with John that there are ways that we can increase seafood consumption without destroying the, the marine ecosystems that we have, and it has to do with choosing what types of fish we eat and reducing some of the global trade we have around it. Um, that level of food security is extremely important to over two billion people in this world. A billion people in the world rely on seafood as their number one form of protein. And most of those people live in um, develop, developing economies and rely on subsistence and small-scale small fishing. I mean, one or two people out in a canoe collecting fish, not trawlers that have 40 to 50 people on, on board who can collect a lot of fish. So the third and final mechanism connecting climate change to conflict is through the widening gap of socioeconomic inequality across the world. Some people call this the north-south gap. These gaps are replicated at the local level in communities that rely on marine resources, at the state and federal level when you have um, concentration of wealth in different communities, oftentimes away from coastal communities, and at the global level in the accumulation of wealth in um, northern and developed countries. And so as climate change affects food and livelihood security, you're going to see a widening gap. And all of a sudden, the governance and the security implications for what were driven by resource questions do not become solutions that are resource-based any longer. Um, it's really a social justice issue, I think. Um, so I liked um, what you said about the good, the bad, and the ugly, and I also didn't want to, to end on a bad note. So I do see some good things happening with maritime domain awareness and um, maritime governance, and that is the recognition by the world, really, um, about the import importance of um, regulating better distant water fishing nations and keeping track of fishing that are being done by large-scale industrial fleets in the waters of countries that rely on fisheries for food security and small-scale subsistence um, consumption. So, for example, the Port State Measures Agreement, which was led by the UN FAO, has now been ratified by enough countries to be put in place. And if you look at African and Southeast Asian countries, and those in um, South Asia as well, you have a very high rate of ratification by those countries because they know that having control over their ports and understanding the transparency behind fishing mo fisheries moving around the global economy is so important to what they're doing. So I would say the Port State Measures Agreement right now needs you need some more adopters to really um, have a global impact, but that's one thing that I think we can have some hope about. Um, the bad is really the lack of data that we have on small-scale fisheries around the world. So um, earlier we saw some fantastic data from the Gulf of Maine, and we just don't have those kind of data sets for most of the world's fisheries. We don't know where, where the fish are, how big they are, how they're reproducing, and how much are being caught. And so in terms of capacity building, simply um, providing avenues and funding for data collection at a species level for fish is so very important um, for developing countries. Um, just to be able to track what's happening because we don't know what we have, we can't manage what we don't know. Um, and the third thing I'll say is the ugly, and that is um, the, the global subsidies for fisheries and fisheries fuel. And in fact, um, a colleague of mine, Dr. Rashid Sumela, is speaking today or tomorrow with the World Trade Organization trying to lobby for reduction in fuel subsidies for global fishing. Fleets. Um, and the reason that most of us can afford to eat the food that we find in seafood restaurants here in the United States is because of government subsidizing the cost of catching those fish in the first place. And so that, I think, is something we absolutely need to address. And to end on a positive note, what I see changing in, um, in Africa and throughout the Pacific Ocean is the um, awareness of the youth on climate change and climate impacts. It's not, you know, it's not just um, Scandinavian youth, they're doing a fantastic job, but across Africa, you see a large awareness of the problem by, by youth and a, and a focus on local solutions that involve communities and indigenous knowledge, which is something that the report really focused on. Um, and also the empowerment of women and the inclusion of women in fisheries and maritime security issues as a means of changing the conversation and some of the paradigms around um, economic exploitation of marine resources. All right. Excellent. Thanks so much. So that's a great segue, I think, to Amy, who is going to talk a little bit about the adaptation burden and how that looks from a developing state's perspective. So I'm really happy to be here today, partly because I feel like historically, 
rather oddly, the human rights and environmental communities have operated somewhat separately, even though we really have a lot to offer to each other. And I guess I'm thinking about this in terms of, I think the science provides the what, the human rights provides the how. So I'll talk a little bit more about what I mean. Um, and first I'll talk about, very briefly, what are the human rights impacts of climate change? I think people have actually covered it pretty well without using the word human rights. But then also, how, what can human rights tell us about mitigation and adaptation? So just on the impacts on human rights, I mean, right to food, right to livelihoods, impacts on fisheries, these are huge. They're, these also arable land, these are gonna be drivers of conflict. Conflict itself breeds more human rights problems. So all of this is, I have to say, pretty grim from a human rights perspective. Um, relocation, migration also raise enormous human rights concerns. I think this goes, this is intuitive. Um, the rights of indigenous peoples are also a particular concern because they're gonna be some of the first impacted groups and they tend to be some of the most vulnerable, partly because they really have no political representation. Usually in their own countries, they're such a small segment of the population. But I'm not gonna focus on the problems because we all know what, I think we all know what they are, basically. Um, I really wanna talk about what human rights might contribute to solutions. And this will pick up on some of what other people have said using different language. So one piece is that if we want governments to feel urgent about, adapt, uh, about addressing climate change, we really need to double down on democracy, rule of law, freedom of expression, freedom of assembly, so that populations that are affected can actually pressure their governments. So in a way, to me, this calls for doubling down on what, let's say, the US government already does a lot of, supporting better governance around the world. So that's pretty easy. We sort of know how to do that, even if it's not perfect. I also think, I want, I want to pick up on something I think I heard in the last panel, which is that sometimes communities themselves can help us solve problems. So for example, if we really respected the land rights, the traditional land rights of people in the Congo Basin or in Malaysia and Indonesia or other areas, we'd be protecting peatlands, right? Indigenous peoples and traditional people with traditional livelihoods have lived in, they've lived in their environments without destroying them for a long time and they know how to do that. So it's one of these areas where there's a real marriage between protecting really important carbon sinks and protecting people's rights. And then what can we learn about adaptation? So what, I, my particular expertise is in the nexus of business and human rights. And we've learned a lot over the past few decades about what happens when you try to engineer big national projects from the top. It doesn't go very well. So there's been a lot of time and energy spent on, for example, in the context of, let's say, mining. How do you actually carry out a project like that with genuine input from communities that are affected? And, and, and why, why would you want that? Well, first, I think Heather sort of alluded to this indirectly. Groups like ind indigenous peoples will actually, first of all, understand the impacts better, and they may have ideas on how to mitigate them that wouldn't occur to us. And that's not just true for indigenous peoples, that's true for communities around the world. But the other reason is that I think it also will, an experience suggests that it will help get community buy-in. So if you're asking people to change how they make their living, change the way they fish or otherwise earn, earn their daily bread, you've got to have them believe in what, what you're asking them to do and they have to be part of coming up with that solution or they won't do it. And in the worst case scenario, it'll actually lead to conflict. So we know how to do this. We have a lot of experience and I guess my call would be when we're coming up with international frameworks or national frameworks, making sure that that approach is embedded. I see bits and pieces of that. Some of the major climate change adaptation funds at least have environmental and social policies. I'm not sure how well that's implemented. This isn't easy stuff but this has to be part of it. We, we won't get where we need to be if we don't have community buy-in and intelligence incorporated into our approaches to climate change. And so that's a challenge. We have to think big, it's a big problem, these big solutions, and we have to think locally, and we have to do both. Thanks. Great. Excellent, thank you guys, appreciate it. So um, that was uh, a really great, I think, translation of some of the impacts we heard from in the first panel into how it looks like in the real world. Um, and I want to take uh, a minute to just think about this idea that we picked up in the first panel of a dynamic world and how we adapt to it. Take a little bit of what I think Sarah and Amy were touching on there at the end.
And, and I'm just going to throw out a quick general question to, to the panel, and, um, and all of you can weigh in as you see fit. But um, how are our multilateral institutions uh, grappling with this challenge, and are they up to the task? But you can take it in, in if you want, uh, regionally. Speak about the Arctic Council, for example, Southeast Asia, um, uh, East Africa. Are, are they um, beginning to deal with this challenge? Um, are they ready for the challenge? What kinds of steps do we need to, to take to improve upon them? I think maybe we heard a little bit of that from Amy just now, but, but I'll leave it to you guys to dive in. Maybe you have well, I'll just start again to sort of pull on the comments of the uh, Arctic Council. My own view is the Arctic Council is straining enormously. Uh, in many ways, uh, the international community is putting a lot of burden on a, a structure that wasn't designed to carry all of that burden. Uh, the Arctic Council is, uh, again, it's an intergovernmental forum. It deals on consensus. It produces some remarkable uh, Arctic clim climate impact assessments and maritime shipping assessments that are extraordinary. I don't think they get much play uh, of them, but they're an incredible value. Um, the, the six working groups that work on a wide variety of issues, they, they do important work. Uh, but it's very isolated, uh, it's not well known. But there's a lot of things now that are happening in the Arctic that the Arctic Council isn't designed to, to do. Um, and so again, what's happening is uh, things are being built around the Arctic Council. So the, the innovations that I mentioned to you, the search and rescue agreement, the oil spill response, there's an international science agreement. It uses the framework of the Arctic Council, so the eight uh, members but then the Arctic Council itself has nothing to do with the implementation of those agreements. Um, uh, the Arctic Council members can, uh, of course, they just uh, didn't, they failed to uh, approve a declaration after the uh, Arctic Council ministerial in May, but uh, all the members can say, yes, this is a great impact, but I'm not going to do anything nationally uh, to reduce the climate impact. So the Russian government isn't reducing gas flaring in the Arctic. Uh, so it, it's nice, it's lovely, but it's not moving the needle. And so what I see, how structures that are being created, the Arctic Economic Council, the Arctic Coast Guard Forum, they're all outside the Arctic Council. So I sort of see